Hello, and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I'm Joe Devine, and today I was joined by Alex Stewart, who's here now. Hello. Hello. Uh, Alex uh, talked to me all about Tiki Taka, which is a topic that we released a video all about on the TIFO Football YouTube channel. You don't need to have watched the video to listen to this podcast, but it may inform your knowledge about Tiki Taka, and it may enhance your enjoyment of the episode. Not necessary, but a choice. Hmm? What do they call that? A preference. That's what I'm trying to say. It's up to your preference. Anyway, we talked all about the uh, history of Tiki Taka. We talked all about the uh, the sort of modern proponents of it. We talked about the evolution of football tactics since that time and also about how fundamental it was and what a uh, sort of a uh, cultural impact and a footballing impact it had. Big deal. Big deal. Anyway, that sounded like I was saying it wasn't a big deal. No, no, it was a big deal. Was that clear, Alex? It was very clear to me. Good, good, good to know. Um, did you know, Alex, that this episode is supported by The Athletic? Yes, I was aware of that. Oh, well, that's good. Did you know that if you go to theathletic.co.uk forward slash TIFO, you can get a seven-day free trial and you can get 50% off an annual subscription that works out to be about £2.50 per month? I was conscious of that also. And do you know what you get when you do that? So much good stuff. So much good stuff and access to the best football writing on the internet. That's theathletic.co.uk forward slash TIFO. Tifo. Do it now. Anyway, uh, no more of me. Well, I mean, there is more of me. You're going to hear me again in a moment. Uh, but no, you know, a pause of me while some music plays and, and then more of me and then a lot more of Alex. Alex, where did the term Tiki Taka come from? Well, there is a little bit of dispute around this. Um, it's generally ascribed to a guy called Javier Clemente, uh, who <laughs> Michael Cox describes him in, uh, I think, in the mixer as like the Tony Pulis of Spanish football. Oh, wow. Um, so he was managing uh, Athletic Club de Bilbao at the time, um, and that that's a Basque club. Um, and the phrase Tiki Taka itself is a apparently a Basque phrase that kind of means little tiptoey quick steps. Um, so he he was sort of talking about this. Uh, I, I suppose if you want to channel the Pulis idea, it, 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 he was this kind of robust old football guy saying, you know, all of this intricate passing and keeping possession and everything is not really how we should play. And of course, Athletic um, are a club that are renowned for being in some ways the most English of Spanish teams. So Athletic, are they're very direct. They often have a big target man. Um, they actually have links with uh, English football, quite strong links with Southampton, for example, which uh, Adam Crafton wrote about in a, a really good book. Um but so it's coming out of this place of that you know this is not how we um, traditionally play football. Um, and one of the interesting things about the Spanish national side is that they used to be known um, as like the Red Fury. It was this kind of very physical, very aggressive style of football. Um, and of course, the advent of Tiki Taka kind of changed all of that. Um, so. Yeah, kind of derogatory, but then obviously it huh. it became um, something that had largely positive connotations, although not always, as I'm sure we'll go on to discuss. Well, let's go back to the to the history of it. I'm interested in the idea that it that it is a partly derogatory term because one of the things that you know in in the script, um, and for those of you you listening who haven't watched the the TIFO video video we released um, today or yesterday, is is on Tiki Taka. Alex wrote the script, and one of the things that you mention uh, is that uh, Tiki Taka can be at its best um, a very exciting f type of football to watch. And at its worst, can be incredibly uh, sterile and tedious. Um, my experience of, of watching Tiki Taka uh, is mostly the latter. I will say, <laughs> of course, there are incredible moments, you know, and, and you know, you, you see the sort of goals that I suppose only a, a team playing a, a Tiki Taka type of football could score. Um, I know that the Arsenal are sort of in and around this area. Not, you know, this is this is a, a Spanish term and, and relates mostly to that Barcelona team and to um, the, the Spanish team. But do you remember that goal that? Arsenal Arsenal scored the, uh, I think it was Wilshire who finished it off, and uh, Giroud sort of tapped it through with his back heel. 
Goals like that, that's the first one that comes to mind as an f- amazing Premier League goal of the last sort of 10, 15 years. Um, but I, I genuinely think that most of my time spent watching, quote, ticky tacka football has been the latter, the sterile and tedious version of it. Why do you think it, it is that, that, that that can be the case? So, so ticky tacka is, is largely predicated on possession. <clears throat> so what is very important is for teams to really hoard the ball. Um, and as as I talk about in the script, this goes back to this kind of Cruyffian sense of, you know, if I have the ball, then I'm dangerous. If I don't have the ball, I have to win it back. Um, and when that's taken to its kind of purest form, obviously what you can do is retain possession without necessarily seeking to achieve penetration. Because when you're moving towards the opposition, uh, you're getting towards the opposition's back line, that is the point at which you need to be most creative in order to breach that defensive line. It's when you need to therefore take the most risks. And one of the things that Tiki Taka can be like if it's not combined with other aspects that I that I talk about in the script and that I'm sure we'll come on to, is is almost the minimization of risk through ramping up possession. So you can play lots of lateral passes, you can play it back a lot, you can play it between your defensive line. Obviously, you know, you're you're doing certain things by by doing that as well. So you're inviting the opposition onto you, you're trying to create space, you're tiring out the opposition forwards if they're pressing. But what it can result in is long passages of play where the ball is kind of shuttled side to side, backwards and forwards, without ever really reaching that point of crescendo. Now, where Tiki Taka is really good is when there is that point of crescendo. And of course, the whole purpose of this possession-based game and what we call positional play, um, which is to to do with the, the arrangement of players in different zones, is to get the opposition out of shape and then suddenly accelerate that passing movement or possibly by dribbling, carrying the ball. And this is why someone like Messi was kind of the X factor in in that Barcelona side, is by moving the opposition around the pitch, gaps appear. And if you have players of the intelligence and the technical capability to then exploit those gaps, you can suddenly accelerate your attack and all of a sudden you get this kind of really exciting liquid football that results in amazing goals. But you have to have that aspect of it and you also have to ensure that you don't simply pass the ball for passing's sake. And I think sometimes Tiki Taka can be associated with that, you know, hoarding of possession. Let's get 800 completed passes and 65, 70% possession football. And that can be quite boring, particularly against a low block. So in terms of uh, people in England, let's say, and and, and the, the uh, English fans' perception of Tiki Taka, of course, as I said before, it relates to that incredible Pep Guardiola Barcelona team. It relates to the Spanish national team between 2008 and, and, and 2012. But at the same time, it does have that negative perception. And uh, another example that comes to mind, and I don't know if you think this is fair or not, again, it sort of straddles uh, between Tiki Taka and something else, is Louis van Gaal at Manchester United. And of course, Louis van Gaal had been Barcelona uh, manager, had been credited with bringing through uh, a number of players, and the same at, at Bayern Munich, who eventually became fixtures of, uh, of very, very good teams. Um, but the criticism of, of uh, Louis van Gaal's Manchester United, the polar opposite of the criticism of David Moyes' Manchester United, incidentally, was that they did just pass the ball sideways and backwards. And that became almost a meme online amongst supporters. And it became a constant criticism of the team in the press. My question is, do you need excellent players to play this type of football? Because, of course, there are lots of different types of football that you can play. And I'm anticipating that your answer is going to be something along the lines of whatever suits the team of players that you have the best, (laughs) adaptability, etc. But I want to ask specifically about Tiki Taka. Is it possible to, to use this system effectively in an environment or in a league where you do not have 
better players than the other team. So that extends down to lower leagues, for example. We've seen we've seen teams like uh, Barrow more recently playing the ball out from the back very successfully in non-league uh, in, in, in England. Um, but the argument is that they have players that are very well suited to that and that they have players who are better at passing the ball than their opposition, so they can do it. Within the context of a league, do you need better players on your team to be able to effectively play this system? Or can the system work with, uh, you know, beyond the, 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 to the total ability of the players? I think it can do, but I think it's tricky. Um, I, there's a few things to say. One of the reasons that, that Barcelona, I think, arrived at this was as much the way that Guardiola wanted to play football as it was the fact that they had a coterie of a particular type of player um, in that La Masia generation <clears throat> where you had people like Xavi, Iniesta, uh, Busquets is a little bit larger but you know still quite slight of frame, um, obviously Messi, Pedro and then people who left like Cesc Fabregas, um, David Villa you you had a kind of um a number of players who were not going to be able to play a particularly robust physical game they weren't i mean they they could press in terms of their fitness levels but they weren't going to disrupt the opposition through physicality um and i think it it therefore mandated a particular style of play that worked to their strengths because it would be stupid for them to have looked at all of these, you know, kind of generational talents. I think it was 2010 possibly where the three best players in the world, according to the Ballon d'Or were Messi, Xavi and Iniesta. Um, so you're not going to not use those guys, but you need to work out a way that plays to their strengths and, and mitigates their weaknesses. Obviously in the Premier League, there has been a tendency, uh, and I think this is even now why we see, you know, um, pressing and counter pressing teams doing particularly well, of uh, physicality uh, and pace. And and I think you know someone like Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool sort of takes this really to its its kind of almost most extreme step. You know, the, the game is played with such intensity, but also such physicality there that it's harder for these other sides to keep up. Um, that means that an English audience is is predisposed to looking at uh, a very, very possession-focused style of play and quite a slow style of play that then goes up through the gears as being something that they're not naturally inclined to enjoy. Um, <clears throat> which means, and I, I'm not saying that the criticism of, of Van Gaal's United team isn't, isn't fair in that respect, and I think, yes, he probably didn't have the quality of players to be able to play that kind of football. But also, if you're a Manchester United fan, then that kind of very uh, ponderous possession-based football that doesn't have the ability to accelerate up is antithetical, not only to the way that Manchester United have traditionally played with, you know, very quick wingers bursting forwards, um, a runner from midfield. You know, they're, they're, United were a, a team predicated largely on, on pace, um, and, and you're kind of looking at this thing going, well, this is not what I expect as a Manchester United fan. It's not what I expect as an English football fan. And also we don't necessarily have players of, of the caliber to be able to do it. And I think this is why, for example, when you have someone like Swansea under Brendan Rodgers, who did try and play this style of football, they had someone like Leon Britton in the defensive midfield role who maybe doesn't get the credit as the sort of intelligent deep lying playmaking footballer that that he should do because um he wouldn't necessarily have fitted that well into what was expected of a of a top level team player in that position but in Swansea because of his ability to pass because of his ability to shield know where the ball was going to be his tactical awareness he was a fantastic player within that system uh United didn't I think really have that kind of player. They tried to uh, to use Delhi De Blint to that effect, but ended up using him mostly as a left back, if I remember rightly. Yeah, and 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 Blint, you know, as somebody who's come out of the Ajax school, would have been quite suited to that. I mean, Blint's one of those funny players who I think has has sort of struggled almost from being too good of a utility player 
to necessarily fit in one place or the other. So, you know, he's played as a, a left-sided centre-back, he's played as a left-back, he's played as a defensive midfielder, as a central midfielder. That kind of player is, I think, more appreciated in leagues that have had a tendency, like the Dutch league or more later the Spanish league, to, to prize uh, adaptability and you know, you know, if you look at, at Barcelona, for example, you know, Sergio Busquets started life as a striker. Um, you know, the, there was a sense of let's find what these guys are good at and then fit them into a position or a couple of positions where their skills are maximized <clears throat> rather than, you know, he's big, he's quick, he can be a center half. It, it's it, There's a little more creativity around that. And someone like Blint, who has the ability to play across a variety of different positions, but maybe looks a little bit languid at times. Is English football wasn't necessarily ready for that at that point in time. No, sure, okay. And can I ask you now about the um, the false nine aspect of this? Because this isn't presumably necessary uh, as part of playing the tiki taka uh, for, uh, style of football, but it can be, can be effective, and it has been in certain teams, right? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the concept of the false nine, um, and again, we've, we've done a video on this before is, is simply the idea that there is a, someone who is nominally a striker, but rather than playing against the last line of defense, looking to play off the shoulder or looking to contest aerial balls drops into the space between the defensive line and the midfield line, where generally speaking, there will be a space because obviously you don't want to have too many players clustered, um, vertically across the pitch. So that means that the the focal point of the attack becomes more mobile um, and starts playing into space or playing in a space where, where they're not being actively marked or if they are being actively marked, it disrupts the opposition's defensive pattern. The reason this works particularly well with Tiki Taka, although we have also seen it, you know, going right back to the Hungarian side with Nandor Hidaguti in the 1950s and other instances beyond that, the reason it works really well with Tiki Taka is that it's all about trying to disrupt the opposition's defensive pattern through this pass and move football. And if you did that, but you had a, a kind of a classic centre forward up front, your focal point would not have the same degree of, of um, mobility. And so what you'd be looking to do is, is create passing channels that that striker could run onto. Whereas by having a player that drops off and then in the case, say, for example, of Barcelona, of having a couple of players like Pedro who can run in off the inside or sorry, off the outside in uh, to get onto passes from that, you, you just open up that final third of the pitch to have more passing angles, more opportunity for movement, more opportunity to beat the defender. Um, and so it, it, it works particularly well there. Again, it's a question of like, you know, if you're that Barcelona team, what what do you do with Messi? You've you've got a player who is the best, possibly the best ever. Um, trying to find a way that maximizes all of the different things he does extraordinarily well, kind of led to this problem solving, which also dovetailed really neatly with the overall premise of Tiki Taka, which is you know using movement and rotation and possession to create space. And with pressing, uh, which again we associate with uh, that Barcelona team, that Spanish team, is it as simple as a team that needs possession has to win the ball back or is there more to it? I think that's the fundamental principle, yes. Um, I mean, it, it again, the, the reason that pressing is sensible is that because when a team has just won the ball back, that's when they're at their most vulnerable. So you know, they've just, they've expended energy. Um, they may be focused on a different part of the pitch. Uh, you know, you might've had to come across to win the ball and be facing towards your own goal. Um, you know, there are lots they're caught of unawares. Yeah, effectively they're caught unawares. I mean, it, it's an odd way of looking at it because they've just won the ball back. So obviously they're not unawares, but there are, there are, there they're are, defensively unawares. They're offensively awares. It's more like the, the, the <laughs> focus of the individual player at that moment in time is on things other than where are the opposition, yeah. uh, other than presumably the opposition player that he's just won the ball off. Um, and so that means that it's the best time to win the ball back because, 
you know, if you then give the centre half, for example, the option to turn, assess his options, find out where his passing options are, clearly it's going to be harder to win the ball back. So okay. it's not it's not just about kind of ruthlessly wanting possession back. It is also the the basic pressing idea of this is when the opposition is most vulnerable, so it makes the most sense to win it back. However, again, if you've got a small team, physically small team, then then pressing, surrounding a player, cutting off passing angles is also probably going to be the easiest way to win the ball back for you rather than trying to have kind of 50-50 challenges and, and win the ball off a central midfielder who's surging forwards because, you know, you're a team of people who are five foot seven. Just a quick interruption in today's episode for me to let you know that we are supported by The Athletic, the best place to read about football online. And today, I'd like to tell you about, I mean, I wouldn't like to tell you, I'm going to get Alex to tell you because that'll be better. I'd like Alex to tell you about a new piece from Michael Cox. What new tactics might we see from Pep Guardiola when football returns? Which, hopefully... It will. Um, so, yeah, Michael's had a quick look at, at what may or may not occur, and he's picked out he's picked out five things actually that that Guardiola might do with City, um, including Kevin De Bruyne making more overlapping runs, sort mm. of being a bit Julian Branty and heading out into wide spaces, uh, potentially using Rodri as an attacking midfielder mm. rather than as a, a pivot. Um, and having greater degrees of rotation uh, among the defence. So um, yeah, possibly inverting his fullbacks a touch, uh, mm. like a, a recent video that we did. So lots of interesting stuff in there. Um, Do you know where listeners detail. can go to, to get that, Alex? Um, I'm assuming that they should go to theathletic.co.uk forward slash... Yes. TIFO? Yes, that's correct. That's the athletic.co.uk forward slash TIFO. And what do they get when they go there, Alex? Uh, they get great football content. No, but what kind of access do they get, Alex? Oh, well, all the access. No, no, no. What, they get a seven? Oh, they get a seven day, day. free trial. Yeah, and, then, and they and, get and 50, 50. 50% off. An annual subscription. Which works out to be. About two pounds fifty a month. Oh, I'm so proud of you. There Thank you go. You. That's the athletic.co.uk forward slash TIFO. Seven day free trial, fifty percent off, an annual subscription, two pounds fifty a month. Hey, it's affordable, it's fantastic, it really does fill your day when you are self isolating at home. Um so I hope you can all enjoy that. And uh, sorry for the interruption. Now back to today's episode. More of me, please. My, my favourite bit of the script is where you describe the effect that Tiki Taka had on football generally. And so whilst uh, not all teams tried to adopt a, a Tiki Taka style, um, the, the impact was felt in other teams. You describe it as being felt particularly in goalkeepers and defenders. Do you want to explain what you mean there? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things that's, that's really interesting is that it, it, it was still... I mean, OK, you have sweeper keepers... Um, and again, sweeper keepers go back a while. There are various outliers who who took aspects of that role and and sought to um, you know take take the goalkeeper as being the opportunity to to launch an attack properly. So maybe that was by throwing the ball or by kicking it accurately. But what Tiki Taka really did was to say that, and again, this is a very Cruyffian principle to have all eleven players capable of rotating the ball, keeping possession, particularly where Tiki Taka was allied with the high defensive line, which it often was. You know, you'd have someone like Victor Valdez 30, 40 yards out of his goal, and it wouldn't be so that he could then launch long raking passes forwards necessarily. Um, It would be another spare option in order to make sure that the ball was rotated, that the opposition were pulled this way and that way. And I think that meant that goalkeepers increasingly had to be comfortable with that because Tiki Taka was kind of uh, like an extreme version of possession football. And you have a sort of, you know, Borussia Dortmund 2011-12 extreme version of pressing. The majority of good teams sit somewhere on the spectrum between those two, but there are aspects of either of them that most teams want to be capable of doing well now and you know being able to play it around the back having a goalkeeper who's comfortable with the ball at their feet who can play it short or long 
having defenders who are comfortable taking the ball under pressure um, and then moving it on. Someone like, you know, Rio Ferdinand, for example, would have been a really great defender in that Barcelona team because he had the capability to bring the ball forwards. He could take it under pressure. He was a good passer of the ball long and short. You know, he, he would have fitted in in that side. There aren't many players that you could necessarily see being transposed in that way. But but the effects now are are such that, you know, most teams would want players of, of that kind of all-round calibre. Let's bring it forward to today's time. And I'm going to ask you about Liverpool and Jurgen Klopp in a moment. But let's stick with Pep Guardiola for now. Why don't we call what Manchester City do now tiki-taka? Has Pep evolved or is the terminology just a, a little bit dated now? I think I think the terminology is a little bit dated now. Um, I think what has kind of replaced it is this idea of um, positional play. And positional play is, of course, part of what made tiki-taka work. Um, I think Pep has probably, coming through Germany and his stint at Bayern Munich, where German football traditionally was more direct, um, I think he's kind of tempered he's he's taken he's taken what was really good about what barcelona did in terms of keeping the ball and moving players around rotating people through zones this idea of positional play and then he's added a kind of directness that he found in german football where you know he was working with players like lewandowski and muller and so on um and and city is kind of almost the synthesis of these things um so that city aren't just keeping the ball for its own sake and and Guardiola is is a player a player a coach who does evolve you can see him trying things learning different things and bringing those things to his next job so for example inverted fullbacks which was the thing that he you know he started using particularly um at Bayern with people like Philip Lahm and David Alaba that's now something that we have seen at City um, it's not really something that he did uh, at Barcelona because there he was looking for the fullbacks to push really high and wide. Um, so he evolves. Um, but I also think, yeah, that the term itself, I think it's so, it's so associated with a particular era, you know, effectively the sort of 2008 to 2012 period where the Spanish national team and Barcelona both dominated to a massive degree it would be weird to then pick that terminology up and sort of plant it you know eight years forwards into the future in the script you quote Guardiola as saying um in the world of football there is only one secret I've got the ball or I haven't and I think you know despite it's not what really you describe, a secret is it <laughs> I mean it's just it's you, can, you can see it <clears throat> Uh, despite what you, you, you say about Guardiola, and I think it's probably still fair to say that Guardiola Prize is having the ball. Jurgen Klopp, however, uh, with his very, very successful Liverpool team, looks at things slightly differently. Now, he, what, his philosophy, as far as I'm aware, doesn't negate that secret. That is still true. But is it fair to say that Jurgen Klopp looks at not having the ball in the immediate uh, moment before regaining it as the most dangerous his team can be? It's like there's a bit of a philosophical tweak on on uh, what Guardiola thinks, right? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think, um, I mean, you know, the the, the German pressing school, um, which began with people like Wolfgang Frank uh, and Ralf Ranjek and Volker Finke, they again, there's a spectrum there, and the most extreme advocates, people like um, Schmidt, for example, who was at Leverkusen almost actively don't want the ball um, so that they can then win it back uh, and and immediately attack from that, the, the sort of proper extreme of counter-pressing. Um, it's the kind of thing that Ralf Hasenhutl, I think, is, is trying to encourage at Southampton as well. Klopp was more like that um, when he was at Dortmund, particularly in that kind of 2011-12 season. And, and I don't doubt at all that in a European level, um, some of what Klopp did arrived as an antithesis to um, Tiki Taka. You know, I, I think that sense of, okay, well, if we're not going to have the ball, um, what are we going to do? And, and um, 
Bayern, for example, um, were able to <clears throat> excuse me to to beat Barcelona um, in I think it was 2012-13 with a kind of pressing and. Uh, you know that there, there will have been instances where where teams have looked at how are we trying to get around this and and what are other clubs doing well, um, and I think Klopp has probably gone through a process where he's thought you know okay well if possession is is the thing at the moment then what can we do to to offset that and how can we be at our most dangerous plus it's it's the school of coaching that he's come out of. Um, but yeah, I mean, he definitely he definitely sees transitional moments as being particularly important, and and it's almost like with Tiki Taka, the important transitional moment is <clears throat> is the gear change. It's when you go from playing the sideways pass to the through ball, whereas with pressing, the transitional moment is when you win the ball back from the opposition and then start to attack suddenly. Um, so they they yeah. philosophically they are very different in that regard. What interests me most about this, right, is uh, the cultural aspect of it. Um, and by that, I mean how the fans pick up terminology or, or don't pick it up um, and what kind of impact that has, uh, that has on how fundamental we see the tactic as uh, being to football. So Tiki Taka is a perfect example, I think, of something, probably the, the biggest uh, thing in the, in the 21st century for football that has had such wide-ranging cultural consequences on the pitch as well. Obviously, you've described the, how goalkeepers and defenders have changed the way that they play, whether or not their team uh, is uh, playing a version of, of, of Tiki Taka. We're also speaking about uh, Jurgen Klopp and the German pressing school. That's obviously had a very big impact on football as well, but it doesn't have the same kind of cultural reach that Tiki Taka does. Maybe that's just because of the name. Maybe like, you know, people aren't saying Gagan pressing or there isn't one terminology that you can sort of cling to which describes all of the things that, that Tiki Taka does. And the, the last one I can really think of, maybe you can you can point out where I'm what I'm missing here, is Total Football, which also had a really cool name and had a massive <laughs> impact on the way that uh, the, the the football teams played football all across uh, Europe. Is there another example, short of maybe you know Greece and Italy winning the Euros and the, and and the World Cup playing very defensively? I know Conte had his three at the back and his wing backs in the Premier League, but that was very much a a sort of domestic thing that happened there. I mean, Tiki Tak has got to be up there, right? Yeah, completely. Um, and is uh, it just because of the name, or is it? I mean, I know not just because of that, but that, well, that has to be part of it, right? No, it it is it is part of it. I'm sure it is because it's a, you know, it's a funny, a funny phrase. It's sort of it, it sounds it's almost onomatopoeic, isn't it? Um, it sticks in the mind it, to English fans. It has that kind of. Um, you know, a, a, an interesting foreignness to it. It, it, it sounds, has a romance. Yeah, that's the word. Yes. Do you know what it's like? It's like um, I'm trying to think of the name of the director, but but um, the uh, you know the director who made um, God, what is the name of the film? In the film, it has a uh, Matt Damon, Jude Law. Matt Damon plays a, a, a psychopath. It's based on the book. Oh, uh, the talented Mr. Ripley. Yes. Okay. So the books that Patricia Highsmith wrote. There yes, you go. That's like, it. Towns of Mr. Ripley. I think. I think this is called the last the last days of November or something like that. I can't remember the name of the film. Had Viggo Mortensen in. That was a great film too. But that is the the American perspective of Europe, where they look at Europe as this kind of old place with history, and everywhere you go, there's a man playing a accordion, and it's all sort of uh, wonderful, and it's like being in Egypt and. Uh, the romance is rife everywhere. Obviously, you and I know that's not true. The streets smell of piss. But uh, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like Tiki Taka to, to English football fans has that had those kind of connotations, doesn't it? Old, wonderful Europe. Yeah, I, I, which I think is interesting because because with that Spanish side, it was such an evolution from from the way that they had traditionally been seen as playing. Um, I mean, the kind of the most fluid and exciting midfield in European football prior to that, that, that got kind of world attention was, was probably the Spanish, sorry, Spanish French midfield of, of 84 with people like Platini and, and Tigana. Um, you know, football had become more defensive. It had become more physical. And of course, even in 2008, when they won the Euros under Luis Aragones, they, you know, they did temper that with some direct football. It wasn't pure tiki-taka, but the fact that a national team was able to win 
you know two consecutive euros and a and a world cup in the middle which is a, a feat that no one has ever done otherwise and also then have this barcelona team with so many incredible players and a manager who was young and interesting and charismatic and had come through the same production line as half those players or more had done as well you know there's there's a really kind of interesting narrative aspect to it too and also this sense of it being able to achieve domination uh, another thing that i mentioned in the script is um I, I remember having a conversation with duncan alexander who's at opta um and was one of the two guys who created the opta joe twitter handle which you know pumps out stats and, and facts about football um I, I expect everyone who listens to this knows that um and and i remember him saying that 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 some of the first tweets that they did that went viral were to do with Barcelona passing statistics and possession statistics, you know, Xavi completing more passes than the whole of the rest of the opposition put together. So again, I think I think it 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 came at a moment where lots of different things coincided. So um you had uh, zonal markings website talking about tactics properly for the first time since Jonathan Wilson's inverting the pyramid. You had people talking about tactics in the mainstream press a little bit more. You had the advent of Twitter and people starting to collect football statistics in the way that cricket fans had always done. And all of these things kind of coalesced at roughly the same time. Mm. Just as I would add team. into that also broadcasting channels trying to make more of the programming around the actual game and bringing yeah. tactics into that a little bit too. Absolutely. And also this is where that narrative thing plays in. You know, if you're there's there's nothing more romantic in in European football than a team who's achieving extraordinary things with a a core of players that have all been at the club since they were 12 or 13. Yeah, and a purity, which is another thing that we haven't really mentioned that Tiki Taka is seen as, um, and it's something I want to, to ask you about now. Um, it's seen as a pure form of football. And by that, I think that people mean it doesn't ha include so much fouling or it doesn't seem to, you know, it's not so aggressive. There's no, there's, there's fewer shoulder barges. It's, it's about individual players and their, and their skill with the ball and their ability to, to pass it to their teammates. And obviously, you know, you and I know that that, description of it as a pure form of football is pretty unfair uh, on other forms of football which uh, are you know to a lesser or more extent seen as pure but it does have uh, that perception doesn't it yeah i mean I, th there's a there's a quotation from rafa honigstein about how um when when spain beat germany at the 2010 world cup um it was the most difficult version of football possible um you know, you had you had this incredible level of possession, very crisp, short passing, at a kind of staccato rate, high pressing, players moving all over the place, the ball moving all over the place, and I think there was there was a thing where it it just when it came together, it looked impossible to stop, um, and I think Barcelona had that as well, in large part due to. Messi's ability and Iniesta's ability to just change the gears and and conjure something out of nothing but I think you know there are, there are other styles of football which yes to 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 press the way that Jurgen Klopp wants you to press is extraordinarily demanding and hard but it's it's a little bit harder I think perhaps to recognize the brilliance of that and and that's why you know while terms like pressing and gag and pressing are kind of in the common football vernacular now they are they're the harder concepts to understand and to explain and and they're they're kind of less sexy because it's about you know moving to this spot to block that passing lane and pushing this guy onto his wrong foot it, you know it's just they don't have that onomatopoeic thing either right they don't uh but it, it's just it's just not as sexy as a bunch of guys who are kind of and and actually not just guys i mean the japanese women's team did this in in 2011 when they won the world cup that's that's kind of how they played too so it's it's not just a men's thing um but but there was something i think there was something recognizably really bloody hard about doing tiki taka well that that caused people to go okay this is 
this is not something I could ever see my team being able to do. Its difficulty was apparent rather than it was with uh, clubs and, and players who are doing things that fans may not notice that they're doing but are equally as hard. Yes, I think that's fair. Yes. And and also okay. they, they would, you know, it's very easy for me, if I go and watch a football game, it's very easy for me to look at the athleticism on display and go, well, clearly I, I can't do that because I'm, you know, I'm not fast enough. I'm not strong enough. And I and can that, do that in a supermarket, Alex. Uh, okay. What, what, Look like, at them running around, <laughs> reaching high and grabbing those things. D- dashing, I'm having to take it really slow. <laughs> dashing for toilet rolls. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, with, with Tiki Taka, there was, there was that, that thing that was even, even more difficult than that. It, the, the kind of the distance between the spectator and what they were appreciating in terms of being able to understand how it's done was sort of so apparent that you would just sit back and, kind of marvel at, at it when it worked really well and i think that did you know all of these things that we've talked about came together to create a, a moment like you say I, I i don't think there's been a a style of football whose impact has been as profound since total football i think that's quite a reasonable thing to say hmm. is there a proponent of uh tiki taka today that is uh doing it the best is there a team uh currently playing that are that are that are ticker tackying uh, better than anyone else um, I don't. I don't think so because part of what's happened is that um, that teams who are dominant in their leagues have come to enjoy significant um, possession relative to the opposition, just as a function of the way that the opposition are now playing. So you know, there's 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 a much bigger split. I think Jonathan Wilson did an article on this maybe a month or two ago um where the the disparity between um the, the amount of possession that two different teams have within the context of a game in the premier league has grown and grown and grown um and the average is something like 65 35 now um wow partly that's skewed because you've got man city and you've got liverpool and you've got a, a couple of other teams that are, are capable of doing that but also you know you see chelsea want to kind of hold on to the ball quite a lot arsenal have always tried to play that way um and you know there are there are other teams that do that and then the antithesis of that is is your burnley or your newcastle or if you're in spain your atletico madrid or your athletic bilbao who don't want to do that and that that gulf has grown and grown so i think there's it's harder to see an outlier that that is doing quite what tiki taka was i mean obviously you know man city do have significant aspects of that to their style uh i think if um if kinke setien gets his feet under the table properly at barcelona you know he he played a very possession-based style of football at betis and will try and bring that back i'm sure at barca so there are there are instances where you can see better versions of it either happening or potentially happening um, but I think football has changed enough and become more antithetical that that there isn't a kind of outlier team in the same way that there was with Barcelona in that period. OK, thanks, Alex. Appreciate that. Hey, what's coming up on the uh, Football Encyclopedia series for next week? We don't know yet. We haven't decided. <laughs> no. What no. might it be? Um, well, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that we could do. So I <laughs> let me look. I'm going to look now. This is a good time to make the the choice. I think. Okay, great. Yeah, let's give people an insight into just how um, d- just how uh, organised we are. Organised we are. Let me just get into my. Sh- shall I? Uh, shall I? I'll get the list drive. up as well. Hold on. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Right. I think upon inspection, Alex, uh, we should do the original shirt numbers by country. Okay, I'll do that. Then. Yes. Do you like that? Yes. Sure, Fine. why not? Okay, well, that's the end of uh, today's TIFO Football Podcast. Thank you so much for uh, listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode and indeed the video about Tiki Taka, which is available to watch on the TIFO Football YouTube channel, as are over 700 other videos. Do go and lose yourself, por favor. Um, Alex, thanks very much. Uh, that's my pleasure, yes. And we'll see you again next week, where I actually think I know what we're talking about next week, but I'll leave it as a surprise. Oh, okay. Yeah, let that suspense really build up. Okay. (laughs) Uh, Au revoir. Bye-bye.